Before I enter into the topic of the hour, two related um, passages or records in the Bible. One of them is Jesus talking about the horrible things coming upon Judea and especially Jerusalem within a matter of decades. And he makes a statement in Matthew chapter 4 in about verse 12. And he said, because iniquity shall be multiplied, the love of many will wax cold. First off, a brief statement of what he did not say and what he, I don't think, meant. He was not saying that because the world and the society and that, especially that environment around Jerusalem would become so ungodly and immoral that uh, Christians would decide, oh, I'm going to be that way too. I think rather what he's suggesting is that because of all the ungodliness and the extent of it, many would finally just give up and become lethargic, desensitized to it all, and think, well, what's the use? I can't go against this flow. It's impossible to live godly in a society as corrupt as this one. And in my mind, there's another incident in the Old Testament that conjoins very well with that. It's a case that's recorded in 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter, about Saul, the king of Israel, and what a predicament they were in. By they, I mean he and a ragtag army, a militia made of volunteers. And the pointed sticks sounds like what um, would be the weaponry that most of them had. They were in the, the valley, backed up against the River Jordan, and the enemy commanded the heights and enjoyed all the initiative. They had the numbers, they had the weapons, and any time they wanted, they could swoop down upon the small ragtag army of Israel. Meanwhile, uh, the few troops that Saul had, well, many of them were deserting day by day. But he waited. He waited one day and then another. He waited about a week. And we're told that he waited till the appointed time for Samuel, the prophet, the Levite, to come. And he waited the days Samuel didn't show up, and the king could not wait the minutes. And it was a horrible thing that he did. And I'm... Uh, thinking more nowadays as I view my life, wouldn't this be a terrible epitaph for my life that I waited the years, the decades, the months, the weeks, but I couldn't wait the final moments? Wouldn't that be a terrible description of your life? I'm speaking to you, many of whom have been faithful for so many years, but the, the ungodliness and the corruption of this world has a way of wearing down our resistance and our stamina. Don't wait the days and then fail to hold out for the final moments. It's not always a matter of coming up with something different to do. When you're doing what's right, just keep on doing it. And I guess that would be the main advice of the evening. Brethren, just keep on doing what you've been doing all along. Now to the sermon, which is very much on, on this topic. I deliberately told this with the intent of having encouraging words for you upon this final occasion, this final meeting in this series. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation uh, this evening for this one, especially for this lesson, because I feel nervous about trying to draw a graphic or represent a photo of God's hand. And uh, our, to us, you know, hands are flesh and blood things, whether black or white, copper or caramel colored, or even albino for that matter. But what color, if I had a picture of God's hand or a photo, what color should it be? I have no way of knowing. And does his hand otherwise look exactly like ours? And so you're going to have to picture the mighty hand of God with, your eye, with the mind's eye. Think about the mighty hand of God. 
I believe God has a hand. I believe God has a body. Because the Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And in that chapter, he's talking about the resurrection. He's saying we, do, we don't just die and then and some disembodied spirit go to the maker or whatever. The gospel is about the resurrection from the dead. Just as certainly as Jesus died, but not only died, arose again. And it was the same fleshly body that had the, the wounds from the spikes and the gash from the, the spear. The disciples saw him in that body, and they could even put their fingers in the nail holes, as you remember. But then they also saw him ascend in that form heavenward until, as you remember, a cloud received him out of their sight. The apostle Paul would say, though we have known Jesus after the flesh, we know him so no more. And John himself, one of the, the eyewitnesses, who saw him in the flesh, said, Beloved, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. Now are we uh, the children of God? And it is not yet manifest what we will be. In other words, we right now, the children of God, don't know what we will be like. But John says, really, that should not be an issue to us because we know if he shall return, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we're not talking about a disembodied spirit who is returning for us. But from all evidence, I know not a flesh and blood uh, body either. So I, I have no doubt here that when in 1 Peter chapter uh, chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that God really does have a hand. But I'm not going to dare try to put a chart up showing you what his hand looks like. But now to the passage itself. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So the two things we have here is the, about the hand of God is being under it and then being exalted by it. Well, what is it like under the mighty hand of God? That does not require a lot of imagination. It is a place of humility. It is a place of submission. It is a place of trust and reliance, especially when you think of the mighty hand of God. You're under his hand and he can crush you in less than a heartbeat. But we trust that his hand will not crush us, but rather it's a place of protection. If you ever gone to the circus or even seen on TV, the guy that'll put his head down and have the elephant <laughs> lift his foot and just touch his head. I wouldn't do that. I don't trust elephants that much. And besides, I'm a security cat anyhow. But, but it's different under the mighty hand of God. There is no reason to fear being in that position and that role. Under the mighty hand of God is most definitely not a place of pride you know, or the pride like, I bear all the weight of all the world's problems on my shoulders. And if I, happen to, <laughs> if I happen to stumble, then the whole world is just gonna go to pieces. And that, that's not what it's like to be under the mighty hand of God. It's a better place to be, however, than to be in the place of pride. Because if you go up to the previous verse, that is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, he said, Yea, all of you, gird yourself with humility. 
to serve one another, for God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. And if you think about that, well, just who needs grace anyway? You know anybody that needs grace? Well, I reckon I do. I reckon, I, I reckon everybody needs grace, and here are faulting, feeble human beings to whom God is willing to extend his grace. But in this verse, who does God resist? Who does God not grant that grace toward? He resisteth the proud. So now, in light of the fact that I need God's grace, yeah, I'm to be in the position of humility rather than arrogance. Oh yes, that's a good, that's a good place to be. Well, then on the other hand, what, what else? I'm sorry for the pun, not intended. Uh, what else is going on under the mighty hand of God? Well, according to the first part of uh, here, 1 Peter uh, 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him. And you notice the word all. This same word is found in the Old Testament in the, the book of wisdom, the book of wise counsel in Proverbs, the third chapter, beginning in verse uh, 5, when the writer exhorts us, trust in Jehovah with all thy heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. Kids, have you ever leaned against something and it fell over with you? You know, not everything is dependable. And the writer here is saying, your own wisdom, your own understanding will embarrass you, will let you down. Instead of trusting in your own understanding, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean upon him instead. In all, there's that word again, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. Not just some, but all. There was a popular radio uh, speaker, I think on t television too, who would give counsel to, to callers. And uh, her advice was, in the common everyday things, go with your mind. But in the really uh, difficult, traumatic situations, go with your gut or go with your heart. And that's just as wrong as can be. When the going gets tough, go with what God says. Trust him in every type of situation there is. But now then, uh, going back to this verse, I believe verse 7, casting all your cares upon him. Does that hint of another hand? What do you use to cast things with? Is it not the hand? So here you are under the mighty hand of God, and now you, you're casting things on him, and uh, that, uh, that doesn't sound very nice, especially metaphorically speaking. Have you ever had a job where your coworkers would dump on you? You know, anything they didn't want to cope with, they'd just dump it on you, and uh, that, that's not very nice. And so why would I dare cast my anxieties, my worries on him? Well, for one thing, it's a command. And second of all, he can handle it. In fact, you need to put things onto him that he can candle, handle, but you can't. The suggestion is here, there are, th there are problems that arise that are just bigger than you are. And you can drive yourself crazy, you can ruin your health, you can get the migraine headaches, you can get the stiff neck, you can get the churning stomach. You can destroy your health if through, I guess, pride again, I'm going to sort it all out myself. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. No, just go ahead and do what he says. Under his mighty hand, he says, you cast your worries upon him. Well, why? Because he cares for you. Uh, the redundancy for the lack of, of emphasis. An humble person is going to cast his or her anxieties upon him. And uh, again, this idea of uh, pride would say, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bear all these burdens upon my shoulders. No, just go and humble yourself and turn it over to the Lord. And he careth for you. 
Isn't that a, uh, an amazing thing? God cares for you. Yes, he does. Uh, we could elaborate at length, but in Romans 8, verse 32, will serve as one, one example. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now that's a question. Were you listening? What's the answer? He who spared not his own sons, will he not give you everything you need? What do you think? What do you think the answer is? God sent his son down here. Jesus went through all the ordeal that we read about in the New Testament. And then God said, okay, that's done. And so I'm just going to sit back and it's up to everybody. You know, if they want to fix their problems, they can. And if they're overwhelmed, that's their problem, not mine. I've done enough. No, God was fully investig investing himself when he gave us his one and only. That means he's totally committed to whatever you need to see you through. You see, Jesus died for your sins. He died so you can go to heaven. Everything is in place to make sure that you can get there. And we need to realize just how much God does care for us. And now for the caveat, um, verse 7, again, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, and yet there are some things that you can't cast upon the Lord. And I find this phenomenon when I think, Jesus died for me, but when it comes to hearing, Jesus is not going to hear for me. I'm going to have to do that myself. Jesus isn't going to believe for me. I got, I got to do that myself. Jesus is not going to repent of my sins for me. Oh, yes, and not only was he willing to die for me, he, he has, but he's not going to repent of my sins for me. And so with you, you've got to do that. You, see, you can cast all your burdens on him, but there's just some things that you're stuck with. And when it comes to, well, there, there are other things of this sort, but uh, in the case of Jesus, when he was scourged, it hurt. When he was nailed to the cross, it hurt. And there are going to be situations where the Lord cares for you. He even died for you. But you're going to have to do some of the hurting yourself. It goes with the territory of taking up your cross and following him. And to add to the list, grief. Grief. You, you're just going to be stuck with profound grief from time to time. That's just the way it is. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care for you. We've, we've already proven He does. He gave His one and only. But you're going to have to do your own hurting. And your best friends can't even do that for you. They can be there. They can co-miserate to a certain extent. But still, they cannot know the grief that some loss brings upon you. It's just that personal. Proverbs 14, verse 10 is not about cruelty, but about reality. The heart knoweth its own joy, or its own bitterness, and a stranger does not intermeddle with its joy. There's just some things you've got to bear yourself, even if you cast all your cares upon him. The removal of uh, some woes will not come immediately, as we find in Romans 7, or excuse me, Revelation 7, verses 15 through 17. When the vision, I think it's of the future, personally, but in the vision, John saw this. They are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun strike upon them, nor any heat. For the Lamb that is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd, and shall guide them unto fountains of waters of life. And God shall wipe away every tear. Ultimately, that's the case. In the meantime, yes, 
there will be occasions of, of tears. But that doesn't mean because God doesn't care, for we know He does. And so understand that some things you must do for yourself, even if you cast your burdens upon Him. One striking example, I think we touched on this the other night. Brother, Brother Everett was talking to me about this point. But last in the list of fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And, and you know, some people think the Holy Spirit just zaps you. He just completes you, he changes you and takes over and he does it all for you. Well, that, that's not what self-control means. He leads you. And if you're following after him, yes, he's leading you. But, but, but he can't be leading, him, leading you if you're not following. And the fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. But that doesn't mean he's doing the control for you. He's teaching you. He's educating. He's building you the character to where you yourself exercise that control. And so, uh, yes, especially our worries, we cast those upon the Lord, but don't kid yourself into thinking that you're just going to twiddle your way into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Picture the current status. We are living in the submission stage under the mighty hand of God. But then we have something in the future to look forward to. That mighty hand that we've been under is the one that will exalt you. The when? When? When did it say? You remember? In due time. God knows when that appropriate time is. Meanwhile, be content with the submission stage. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. And let me just add in passing, that's going to work a lot better. That is God exalting me in due time than me trying to promote self. He's going to do a better job of that than I could anyway. So why not just submit? So the perspective is submit to God. Cast your cares upon him. Don't delude yourself into thinking that you are relieved of personal responsibilities, however. The griefs that will come to you in this life, the other burdens and the pain. And a lot of, I know a lot of the people that are sitting here tonight are experiencing pain. And we're just told that there will no temptation come our way that is impossible to bear. That's easier said than done. But again, we trust God. And again, if he knows every sparrow that falls from the sky, he knows right now of every ache and every pain. Physical and, of course, the other time. The heartbreak kind of pain. The grief kind of pain. And so uh, we, we have to endure some of that. I guess it's a way of reminding us that we're not in heaven yet. We're not in heaven yet. It's something to wait for. And some changes in the life. Repentance is a, is a very excruciating thing. And the conversion process has been likened unto a crucifixion. As you know, a crucifixion was a type of execution where a person would be put to death. But it was developed, scientifically developed, to be an excruciatingly painful type of death and also a humiliating type of death. And so your conversion is described as being like a crucifixion. It'd be so much easier if I could, you know, just if I finally know that I'm off course and I deny it, someone corrects me, no, I know where I'm going, I'm doing it, and just kind of gradually start you know, easing around like these A-10s. You know, they don't stop in midair and put it in reverse. No, you just make, make gradually make your, your loop around, your turn around, and pretty soon you're going the opposite direction. Repentance isn't that. Repentance is a tooth-jarring about face, and it can be embarrassing, and it can even be painful. And we have to experience the part of the conversion process is painful like a crucifixion. Jesus already did that for you one time. He's not going to undergo the painful 
repentance process for you a second time around. So under the mighty hand of God, the humility that's required. And in summing up this little speech, I reminisce about, back uh, over my decades of preaching. About the time that I began to routinely preach, I, I would be thinking, of course, of the job and how that preachers would get up and sermon after sermon after sermon, they'd preach on baptism. Because, you know, baptism's a problem. We got all these folks out here, they just, they're just not doing what the Bible teaches on the subject of baptism. But I got to thinking, you know, every denomination believes in and advocates and practices something that they call baptism. And so what if the problem isn't baptism? Especially for those who, who do they actually even immerse in water? And, and yet, they're not doing it for the right reason. And they'll even mock and deny the, the purpose of baptism. So is the problem really baptism? Or is it faith? If I'll be baptized, but I don't believe that the, uh, what the Bible says, the purpose of it, my problem is faith. And then eventually, the older I got, I realized, you know, the problem isn't lack of faith, is that people won't listen. People just won't hear what God says. And again, it's something that we have to do. We have to hear. We have to believe. And then that repentance process that's so painful. I have to face the fact that I'm wrong. I'm a sinner and there's nothing I can do to change the consequences. I need the mighty hand of God to interpose with grace. And then remain humble. The, the other passage, you know, that has to do with the topic of conversion, isn't it Matthew 18, about verse 3, thereabouts? Except you humble yourselves and become as little children, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. we got to get rid of the pride in order to even be born as a citizen of that kingdom. So think about yourself and think about if you're doing your part and then think about all this God has done and how that place of humility under the mighty hand of God is a shield. And ultimately, the mighty hand of God will exalt you in due time. That's the message, my friend, my brother, my sister. If you have a spiritual need, the song has been selected, that selection announced, and we're going to be singing together. Please consider it your opportunity to come and make your spiritual needs known to this good group of people. God bless you, everyone. Let's stand, and together, let's sing.